The essay question in my O-level English paper was, whose biography would you most like to write? There was never any doubt in my mind. Why Orwell? Because he matters in a way that 99 out of 100 writers do not. But is there anything new to say? I went looking for the Orwell who doesn't feature in the memoirs of the great and good. The man recalled by ordinary people who knew him long before he was a giant of 20th century political thought. People like Dora Georges, who grew up near Southwold in the 1920s. One day I was walking past the, uh, the gardens with a friend uh, and uh, he, came, he appeared with a folded um, a note paper that she handed to me. And um, when I opened it and read it, it was Ode to a Dark Lady. And there was some emphasis on my Greek ancestry, I suppose, because I'd been born in Cyprus and my father was a Greek Cypriot. So what did you do with this poem? Well, I kept it for quite some years, actually, and then I seemed to disappear. <laughs> and it wasn't until much later <laughs> that I realised, you know, who had written it, because Eric Blair was n no connection with George Orwell, of course, in, m in my mind, uh, well, for quite a long time. And what was Eric Blair like physically? He suffered from a lot of colds and he wasn't uh, terribly fit, I don't think. He was rather gauche in his speaking and uh, spoke rather jerkily at times uh, and uh, rather disconnected sentences. It didn't make a great impression on anybody, I don't think that's the way about what I can say about it. Orwell's footsteps are well trodden, but it's still possible to find something new. Three years ago, I went to interview an old gentleman named George Summers, whose fiancée, Dorothy Rogers, used to walk home from work across this common in 1934. But Dorothy had a secret admirer, who used to lie in wait for her each afternoon, until the day that George Summers arrived on his motorbike and chased George Orwell away. I tried, I missed him. I went, I suppose, 50 yards, and there he was, and there she was. I was a guardian angel. I ran up the bank. I sort of pushed him off. I didn't kill him. Orwell may have been remembered as shy, gauche and painfully traditional in his attitudes to the opposite sex. But in his quiet way, he was something of a Southwell ladies' man. In the early 30s, he was deeply attracted to a woman named Eleanor Jakes. Their relationship only ended when she decided to marry his best friend, Dennis Collings. I wonder if this is signed up. It's down and out in Paris and London, of course. Because that's the one. Paul. Is that signed? With best wishes and so many thanks for bothering to buy this copy. Eric A. Blair, 12133. My mother met him when they lived next door in the town, and because they had such strong political mm. ideas, obviously got to know each other like that. Yes. He wanted my mother <laughs> to go round the women's doss houses just as he'd been round the men's doss houses. To do some investigation. Yes, but she did she decline. Did, she did decline. <laughs> he mm. came back and he said, I know what I'm going to call myself. I'm going to call myself George Orwell because it's a good round English name. And Eric Blair's such, such a thin name. And he'd seen the river as he presumably he had seen the so. river Orwell. Yes, which gets, so which that, goes through that was the reason why he switch. did it. When David was looking for material, what he was also looking for were pictures of Orwell, movies of Orwell, uh, pictures of his family, and that sort of material. And what he did was actually find an awful lot of stuff that we didn't know existed. Oh, that's the, this uh, is that, the one, isn't that it? That is extraordinary. Oh, this yes. is pure gold here from the bunker. Yes, now, there yes. we <laughs> Eric, Jeff, Self. Now, Self is your mother. Yes. Eric holding the dog again, and that's a family friend, isn't it? And I've yes. never, that, that is completely, you know, that, that's the first new photograph of Orwell I've seen in, I suppose, over a decade. Why do you think it was that your mother married your father rather than, than Eric at that time? Well, what she said was, I think I was only about 10 at the time, mm. he was either too cynical or too sardonic, and I think, because I didn't know what the word mm. meant, I think it must have been cynical. Orwell's last visit to Southwold was in the summer of 1939 to attend his father's deathbed. 
as was the custom, the corpse had a copper penny placed on each eyelid. Only Orwell could have found a moral dilemma in what to do with the coins. In the end, he walked down to the beach and threw the pennies in the sea. By the mid-1930s, Orwell had said goodbye to Southwold. He decamped to Hampstead to work in a bookshop and infiltrate London literary life. Gordon Comstock, the hero of his next novel, Keep the Aspidistra Flying, is a friendless, moth-eaten poet. As ever in his work, Orwell was fashioning romantic versions of himself that he could project onto the printed page. It was a stupid thing that he had done, fancy sending a poem to a paper like the Primrose, as though they'd accept poems from people like him. The mere fact that the poem wasn't typed would tell them what kind of person he was. He might as well have dropped a card on Buckingham Palace. I went to what is now called the Pont Corner in Hampstead, uh, that was then a bookshop, which was run by a grey, tall, gaunt-looking man. I wanted this Woodhouse book, and he tried to palm me off with a book he'd obviously been anxious to get rid of, called A Trader Horn in Madagascar, which is not at all what I wanted. So after a slight dissension, I got away with the um, slightly grimy copy uh, of the Woodhouse, so it was sold as new. But that, in fact, I realized uh, many years later would have been Orwell. 